rejoicing his holy name. He is exalted, the King is exalted on high. One more time. He is exalted and he is exalted on high. Sounds good, but you can do better. I know you will. If you can do tenors, do it, sopranos, altos, basses. Come on, let's get a big choir going in here for the next one. Which one is that? Oh, yeah. Majesty. Majesty. Worship His Majesty. Jesus who died for glorified King of all kings. Just the one more time, let's do it. Worship his majesty unto Jesus, be all glory. Majesty, kingdom of authority, flow from his throne unto his own, his empty praise. So exalt, lift up on high the name of Jesus. Jesus, the King, Majesty, worship His Majesty, Jesus who died, now glorified, King of all kings. Amen. Sounds good. Wow. Those of you watching home, enjoy the big chair there in front of your computer, whatever you are, or your phone in the kitchen. Hmm. But anyway, sing with us. The next one is one that is one of the most beautiful anthems ever written. How great thou art. We all know it. Five verses. This is going to be a challenge. Let's do a little quick. Oh Lord, my God, when I in awesome wonder, consider all the worlds thy hands have made. I see the stars. I hear the rolling thunder. Thy Dog. 
God his son not sparing, sent him to the ice curse can take it in. That on the cross my burden gladly bearing, he bled and died to take away my sin. Come on, let me hear you. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to Thee. How great Thou art, how great Thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to Thee. Joy shall fill my heart, then I shall bow in humble adoration, and there proclaim, my God, how great Thou art, then sings my soul, my Savior God to Thee. Sopranos were doing beautifully. I heard that. Remember, I mentioned the four voices earlier? I saw a sister back there doing all four of them. But it was there, but you sounded good. Whoever you are, God bless you. Let's do the next one. Oh, that's it. Boy, that was fun. Okay. At this moment, we're going to talk to the Lord. There's so many things happened this past week we saw a couple of miracles pass this past week and you know we're glad that those who work for the house of the lord here on sabbath doing one thing or the other god used them and one of them was healed i think pastor henry probably might mention that later on but then other some of us have situations oh yeah we have pains also They'll be there until Jesus returns. But he says, be faithful. And the best promise of all is, I will come again. Amen. Be patient. Be faithful. And I said before, you know, the favorite verse of my mother, which is in her grave, my grandmother's grave, and it's going to be on my grave. I want that verse that says, be faithful unto death. And I will give you the crown of life. So based on that promise, I'm going to ask those who can. I cannot do it because my knees. But if you can kneel down, let's do it. Let's talk to the Lord and ask for his presence one more time. Father in heaven, once more we come to your house. The Bible says, I was glad when they say unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. The Bible also says, this is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. And we are glad that we can be here, Father. You know every petition. You know every mind here. You know the pains we might be going through for many reasons but we want to thank you because you have answered prayers this week i'm a witness of one of them 
some of us are witness of one of them and we thank you for that be with every man every woman in this place with every child may the holy spirit be with the children so we can feel reverence in this church we also ask you father for those who are visiting with us lord we hoping they come back and worship with us if they're here give us a special look in our faces saying welcome come back and then lastly we ask for Pastor Wright as he preaches this morning and bring the message that you have given him. Touch his lips, his brain, his words, Father. But most of all, may our minds be receptive to the message you have for us today. For we ask in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Jesus, we love you, we worship and adore you, glorify thy name in all the earth, glorify thy name, Glorify the name in all the earth. God bless you all. Okay. Good morning, church. Happy Sabbath. What do Frederick Douglass, Harriet Tubman, Martin Luther King Jr., and Ruby Bridges all have in common? Yes, you're right. I know what you're thinking. They're all black American. But more importantly, they all trusted in God to help them during hard times. Look at this quote from Frederick Douglass. Oh God, save me. God, deliver me. Let me be free. Help me run away. God willing, I will run away. And God did help him to run away. This is Harriet Tubman. I trust you. I don't know where to go or what to do, but I expect you to lead me. I pray to God to make me strong, and he did. We all think of Martin Luther King Jr. as a strong, brave, and courageous leader, but even he got discouraged at times. Listen to this. And I bowed down over that cup of coffee. I never will forget it. Oh, yes, I prayed a prayer, and I prayed out loud that night. I said, Lord, I'm down here trying to do what's right. I think I'm right. I think the cause that we represent is right. But Lord, I must confess that I'm weak now, I'm faltering, I'm losing my courage. And I can't let the people see me like this because if they see me weak and losing my courage, they will begin to get weak. It seemed that that moment that I could hear an inner voice saying to me, Martin Luther, stand up for righteousness. Stand up for justice. Stand up for truth. And lo, I will be with you even until the end of the world. But I heard the voice of Jesus saying still to fight on. He promised never 
to leave me, never to leave me alone. No, never alone. No, never alone. Promise never to leave me. Never to leave me alone. And I bowed down over that cup of coffee. I never will forget. And I bowed down over that. And God never left him alone. This is Ruby Bridges. She was one of the first black kids to go to an all-white school in New Orleans. On her first day of school, an angry mob shouted at her. But she still went in. And she still trusted in God. She even prayed for the people. Even a six-year-old girl can trust in God and be strong. Often during Black History Month, we think and talk a lot about Ruby Bridges, Harriet Tubman, Martin Luther King Jr., Rosa Parks, and more. But let us not forget that the God that they served in who helped them during discouraging times. And let us not forget that he can help us now during our discouraging times. Okay, this is a very special moment, and we have enough people to surpass the Mormon Tabernacle Choir. We got plenty of people. We're going to sing one of the most beautiful anthems ever written, also known as the Black National Anthem. Lift every voice and sing. Let's do it. It is now time for our children's story. So if all the boys and girls can come up front, please.
All right. Good morning, boys and girls. All right, all right. I, I, I know it's not 80 degrees like it was on Thursday, so maybe that's why we need a, a little bit of practice with our good morning. Let's try one more time. Good morning, boys and girls. Good morning. Thank you very much, and a good morning and happy Sabbath to you all. First thing I'm going to do before I even start is I'm going to start my timer. Sometimes I can talk a little bit too long, and I want to make sure that I don't talk too much. I have a really cool story that I want to share with you all, but before I even share my story, and, and I do this a lot. If, if you've come when I've told children's story, I always like to ask questions first. I always like to ask questions. Do you all know what one of the best gifts that God has given us? What do you, what do you think, Janae? I think one of the best gifts that God has given us is life. Is life. Amen. You are absolutely right. That is one of the best gifts that God has given us. Is there anything else? Can anybody think of anything else? What do you think is one of the best gifts that God has given us? Lollipop. Uh, lollipops. Wow. I was not expecting that, but you are right. Lollipops. Do you know one of the best gifts that God has given us? Yeah. What is one? Tell me. A Amen. You are right about that. That is one of the best gifts. Yes, Eliana. Family. Family, for sure. Sine, what do you think? Brothers and sisters. Brothers and sisters. What do you think, Sarai? Jesus. Jesus. Oh, these are all fantastic answers. Let me tell you all the one that I'm thinking about, and you all were absolutely correct. One of the best gifts that God has given us is the gift of choice. God said you all are able to make a choice or a decision for yourselves. And it's one of the best gifts that God has given us. So keep that in mind. Let's jump right into our story. Now, maybe you all have heard this story before. If not, this will be the first time. If you have heard it, there's a Bible story that I'm going to connect it to. So maybe you never heard of the Bible story. Connect it to the one that I'm about to tell you. But here we go. One of my favorite places to go to growing up. And I know some of you are thinking the gym because I'm a PE teacher. Yes, I loved going to the gym. But it's a different place that I loved going to. Some of you may be thinking, oh, maybe your grandparents' house. Hey, the grandparents' house was so much fun. Church was another one. But there's another one. And you probably never guess it. You know why? Heaven, yeah, we're not there yet. <laughs> yes, that is going to be the best place that we can go to. But one of my favorite places to go to was the barbershop. Yes, the barber shop. And I know you would probably never guess that. But when I was your age, I had a full head of hair. And I would love to go to the barber shop. The barber shop was one of my favorite places. And do you know what? It wasn't necessarily because they would give me nice, clean haircuts. That was part of it. That was part of it. I would get the nice, the nice lines and my hair would be faded. And I would always make sure that I would go to the barber shop after school on Friday because on Sabbath, I wanted to look my very best. And so I loved going to the barber shop. But you know what was even better than just going to the barber shop? was talking to my barber. That was the person who would cut my hair. And we would talk about everything. We would talk about life. We would talk about school. We would talk about family. We would talk about everything. And it was so awesome. I felt like I always had somebody to talk to. And that's why I liked going to the barber shop. 
Now, my haircut may have only taken 15, 20, 30 minutes, but I would be there for hours just because I would love to talk to my barber. And you know, the barber is interesting because the barber would meet so many different people. The barber would talk to different doctors, maybe lawyers, maybe construction workers, maybe chefs. The barber got to see everybody. And the barbers were really smart. They always had good advice. They always had good advice. One day, a pastor came in to see the barber. And they were talking, and the barber found out that this was a pastor, a man of God. And the barber said, you know, I don't believe in God. And the pastor sat there, said, hmm. He said, if there was God, then, then, then why do bad things happen in our world? I thought that was a good question. Why do bad things happen in our world? And the pastor just sat there and listened and listened and listened. And the pastor was listening and the barber was talking. And then when the pastor's haircut was all done, he got up and left. And then the next time he came, he didn't just come by himself. The pastor brought somebody with him. Now, this person hadn't had a haircut in a long time. Their beard was full. Their hair was really, really long. And the pastor brought in this person and said, you know, it's a shame that barbers don't exist. And the barber said, what do you mean? He said, well, I've seen this person sit outside the barber shop, but nobody's ever given him a haircut. Barbers must not exist. And the barber said, no, I exist. This person just never came to see me. And then he remembered his conversation that he had about God. God wants us to choose to see him. He doesn't want to force us. He wants us to choose. And that reminded me of the story of the prodigal son. Remember, there was a father who had two sons. And one chose to leave his father and do whatever he wanted. He wanted to live his own life. And did the father say, nope, you're not going anywhere? Did the father say, nope, you got to sit right here? No. Nope. He gave him his choice. He said, if you want to leave, you can. And the son went away, and he realized that he needed to be with his father. And so he turned back. And remember, he said he was coming back to his father. And did the father wait until he was right next to him? No, the story says, while the son was far, far, far away, the father got up and ran towards him. And then there was another son in that story. There was, a, there was a son that was right next to his father that served his father. Day in and day out, he worked for his father. But he didn't feel very close to him. He said, your other son came back and you threw him a party, and I've been working here so long for you, and you haven't even given me the smallest thing to celebrate with my friends. And the father told him, I have always been with you. Whatever I have is yours. He wanted his oldest son, the son who stayed close, to choose to serve him and to be there with him. Boys and girls, God gives each and every one of us a choice. He's not going to force us. He wants us to choose to love him and serve him out of the goodness of our heart. And when we do, he will reward us. 
And so I hope that we can all choose today. We don't have to wait until tomorrow. We don't have to wait until we're grown. We can choose right now, right here today to serve him. I hope that's your prayer because that is my prayer for you. Would anybody like to have a closing prayer for us? You want to pray for us? Want to pray? No? Janae, you want to pray? Okay. Dear Jesus, thank you for this day. Hope that everybody had a great church today. Hope that af hope that this weekend everybody has fun plans. Even if they don't, hopefully they don't get hurt. And hopefully when bad things happen, um, they always rely on Jesus to help them get through the bad things. Amen. Amen. Okay, boys and girls, you all can go back to your seats. Thank you so much for listening. It's a very special way of coming down the steps. Oh, yeah, she made it. <laughs> Beautiful to see this church in 10 years, and you see all these children growing up and taking part here and so on. Well, this is the moment that we return to the Lord what belongs to him. Everything belongs to him, but he asks us to do that 10%. Uh, something special, because when I see the deacons, and I hope they're here somewhere, they're coming in, our deacons? Oh, they're coming. But there's a situation that I watch the deacons' faces, and I feel sad because they go by row by row, and this is the situation. Most of us give our offerings and tithe online, right? So when we come here, we just don't do. So the poor deacons bring the plate and they go empty, empty. But I have a challenge for you. Even if you gave home, even if you did that online, I'll tell you what, I want to see those deacons smiling <laughs> and not feeling disappointed. Starting with me, I'm going to put money cash. So you will smile when I do this, even though I gave at home online. Is that a challenge for you? Yeah. Oh, yeah, I know that it is. You go deep in your pockets and look, it's there because we can use that also, and let's have the deacons pick up the offering, and at the end, please, all four of you, come meet me here. We're going to pray for the offerings after that. Thank you.
Okay, the deacons, please come forward with the tithes and offerings. Let us pray. Father, this is sacred money. We're returning back to you. It belongs to you. I want to ask you, Lord, to bless those who gave. Those who could not, it's okay, Father. You understand. May our homes be blessed. May our children be blessed. Because we are in business with you this way. For we ask in your name. Amen. Amen. An empty spot beside him where I once used to wait. To be filled with strength and wisdom for the battles of the day. I would have passed him by again, but I clearly heard him say, I miss my time with you. Those moments together, I need to be with you each day, and it hurts me when you say you're too busy, busy trying to please me, but how can you serve me when your spirit's empty? There's a in my heart wanting more than just a part of you it's true I miss my time with you what will I have to offer how can I truly care? My efforts have no meaning when your presence isn't there. But you'll provide the power if I take the time to pray. I'll stay right here beside you and you'll never have to say I miss my time with you Those moments together I need to be with you each day And it hurts me when you say You're too busy Busy trying to serve me me when my spirit's empty. There's a longing in my heart, wanting more than just a part of you. It's true. I miss my time with you. I miss my time with you. Together, I need to be with you each day, and it hurts me when you say you're too busy, busy trying to serve me. But how can you serve me when you speak? Wanting more 
than just a part of you. It's true. I miss my time with you. It's true. My precious wife loved that song. I miss my time with you. The testimony from Jesus. Shall we kneel, those who can? When we kneel, Lord, we cut ourselves in half. We should be flat on our faces before you. And we confess that we have not given you all the time we should have. Often involved in things with good intentions, we're reminded by that song how much you enjoy us. What a high compliment. Speak to us now as we open this book that you have sent to us, this letter of love and instruction. Let the words of my mouth, and the meditation of my heart, be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. And the people said, Amen. In preparation for next week, you'll want to read Luke chapter 10. The sending out of the 70 the story of the Good Samaritan, and then the incident of Mary and Martha entertaining Jesus, and Mary choosing that good part. I will visit that chapter on next week, Luke, the 10th chapter. I have to just admit that I'm very happy today because guess who's back there running the sound system? Seems to me like the saints ought to just pause and give joy that Kevin, go on, put your hands together, Kevin is here. Now, those of you clapping in ignorance, He was taken to the hospital. I'm on my way home Thursday, having had a long day. See the texts rippling through. He's been taken to the hospital the night before. Something on the back of his spine. And the prognosis did not look good. We went to praying. Come on, saints. That's the weapon the devil cannot handle. Woo! Don't get me started here. We went to praying, and some of us visited. And before the night ended, the doctors came and said, we see no reason to keep you. Everything is going to be just fine. <laughs> now you can put your hands together with intelligence. So I just had to pause and mention that. And then 
I'm bursting with pride because our robotics team, you know we have a robotics team? Now they ought to have somebody else had no idea. We have a robotics team, young people that build little machines and things that do all kind of odd stuff. And Kristen, Pastor Kristen is over that. And they went up yonder last week. Five teams, they beat the whole bunch of them. <laughs> Our robotics team, they call themselves the RoboCats. Come on, give the RoboCats a hand. Yes, sir. So the pastor's just walking tall, praying church, RoboCat church. You know, what, what, what are you going to do with me? And then the ladies want me to mention something about a meal. Some kind of meal taking, help me see for some kind of meal taking place. Prayer breakfast, when is that? Next Sabbath. See, I can't get in trouble with the women folk. They told me, mention it, Pastor. So I'm mentioning it. So these are just things, you know, pastors walk around smiling. You don't know why we're smiling, because all this good stuff is going on. Isn't God good? That's so pitiful. I said, isn't God good? Amen, he is. All right, I'll get, to, I'll get to preaching here in a minute. Restoration has been the theme for those of you visiting since I came. And we're looking at God remaking things. And the Lord has led me to a very familiar passage, just like we did last Sabbath, last Sabbath, Matthew 28, 19, and 20. Well, this Sabbath, and Kevin left that up there, John 14, 1 to 3, because I want them to read it with me. You see it? Let's stand and read the word together. Come on, come on. Let's stand and read the word together. It's the main text. Everybody, let's go. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Oh, you sound so good. Let's try that again. Come on. Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. Keep going. Keep going. In my Father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back. All right, be seated, be seated. The key phrase is, pre listen to me, the key phrase is a place for you. No, no. <laughs> Jesus, as I have studied his sayings in Scripture, Jesus never says something that's not necessary to be said. That wasn't a good sentence, but you followed it. If he says it, there's a reason for him saying it. There's something that has goaded him to say what he said, a place for you. If he's preparing... Stay with me now. If he's preparing a place for me, that means I have no place. Oh, I'd love it to see if it when they do that. Mmm, that just, just, just does something for the preacher. It means I've hooked their brains already. <laughs> Jesus is suggesting that his believers are displaced persons. Now, I know you have a home and address, 4904 Pleasant View Court. That's me. Been there for 20-some years. But Jesus just told me, that ain't your place, Henry. So that stirs me to look to Scripture. Because there must be some reason why the Lord tells me I don't have a place. Because I thought I did. Mortgage is paid. Now, don't fool yourself about that being 
your place, even if the mortgage is paid. Because all you got to do is miss your property taxes one year, you'll find out whose place it is. <laughs> Can I get a witness in the house? In fact, you may not know this, but legally, the United States of America never gives up property. It's always theirs. So even when you thought <laughs> you had a place, at best you just written. <laughs> huh? So this getting, I'm, I'm getting some depth. I'm getting some, I'm getting some depth out of Christ's statement. He's, he's saying to me, Henry, I go prepare a place for you because whether you know it or not, Henry, you really don't have a place. You really don't have a place. Now, if you've noticed, I've preached six sermons to you in the eight weeks I've been with you. In every sermon I've preached, I always go back to Genesis. And we're going there right now. See, the reason why Genesis is my favorite book in the Bible, I'm a contextual thinker. I'm a homiletician. Therefore, I know that unless you can understand how things got started, come on now, until you can understand how things got started, you can't get a full picture. And I love Genesis because it tells me how the mess started. And we are in a mess. So when I go to Genesis, I read something shocking that that, that I had not really paid attention to that would cause Jesus to say some 4,000 years later, you ain't got no place, right? You don't have a place. I'm going to fix one for you because you don't have one. And I thought, sure, I had a place. But here's what happened in Genesis chapter 3. You remember the sin. No need to go back through that. Our first parents messed up big time. And God was not happy with them and came down to visit with them. You remember that? They heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the Lord said, Adam, where are you? I heard your voice. And I was afraid. Because I was naked. And I hid myself. And of course, you know the rest. The Lord asked him, who told you naked? And he, of course, he copped out on the woman. But, but that's all right, 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 that's all right. Here's what happens. When he gets done, God spewing out the various uh, 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 results of their sin, the consequences of their error, here it is. Here it is. Yeah. Oh, oh. Well, let's go here to verse, and let's set it up on verse 23. Therefore, the Lord God sent him where? Sent him where? Out of the garden of Eden to till the ground which he had taken. So he drove out the man, and he placed cherubim at the east of the garden of Eden, a flaming sword which turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. The sheriff... The sheriff evicted the couple, not but two human beings, so he evicted the entire human race. They had no place. Then he takes one of his deputies, guardian angel, puts him at the gate so they can't come back in and get this stuff. Come on, y'all. This is real here. Are you listening to me? We have been displaced since the Garden of Eden. Kicked out. Now, don't raise your hand now. Have you ever been evicted? Do you imagine what that could feel like? The sheriff comes and locks you out of your house. You thought it was your house. You were paying the mortgage and things got tough. And you can't get back in because the door is locked, sealed by the authorities, and there you are with your family, your kids, no place. You 
You know, human beings do a lot of silly stuff, stupid stuff, in order to feel placed, connected, accepted. In fact, the entire, the entire uh, uh, commercial world feeds on our need to fit somewhere. You're not really bathed right unless you use dial soap. <laughs> so you go hustling, dial soap, got to do it. I mean, watch commercials. Every commercial is based on the psychology of making you dissatisfied. Isn't that true? And we do, we, all, all this now, this is okay, okay. Somebody's going to get upset, but that's all right. I'm a preacher. We upset folk. God gives us the right to do that. The folk with these tattoos. Dissatisfied. God done made your body. You ain't got no marks all over your body. Oh, they've gotten quiet. Lord, they've gotten quiet. Dissatisfied with who we are, where we are, we put on all kind of perfume, we bedeck our bodies with all kind of trinkets. Oh, see if I'm going to be in serious trouble. They're going to be texting me from the time I get home till the next time I preach. Pastor, how could you say those things? You make people feel uncomfortable. I'm, I'm just telling the truth. A lot of stuff we do, now let's be honest, a lot of stuff we do, we do to be accepted. Isn't that true? You know it's the truth. Wear a certain style suit, wear a certain style shoe, and they play games with us. You know, go through a period where the dress is up, another period the dress is down, another period the dress has got a split, another period the dress ain't got no skirt. So, I mean, <laughs> and we just follow along like donkeys, follow along like donkeys. No, and, and, and they're playing, they're playing on your need to be accepted. Come on and say amen. You know I'm telling the truth. The devil plays on your insecurities. Jesus is crying. You don't have to. He's going he's to fix the dress thing. White robe, one color. <laughs> one style robe. Come on, somebody. God said, I'm not going to have that foolishness in the new earth. I'm going to put one style, one color, one size fits all. Hallelujah. Because God knows what we have done to ourselves all these years just to fit. And Jesus says very clearly, hey, just calm down, right? I'm going to prepare a place for you. And you know if Jesus prepares it, it's going to be just fine. What do you say out there? So the Lord makes this statement. He makes this statement. I go and prepare a place for you. And the thing is, if you follow the Bible, this, this um, text we just referred to becomes almost like a mantra, a beating drum in the Bible. The, the, this, the early saints called it the promise. What did I say? The promise. The promise. They would quote it. Jesus said, I prepare a place for you. And they, they held that thing dear. It was precious to them, the promise. In fact, the second Peter refers to it as the promise. I will come again. And they, 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 they in fact, some folk memorized it. They, those words would comfort them in times of stress and agony and doubt and fear and catastrophe. Jesus has said, I got a place for you. And for the early Christians, many of whom were put out of their homes, lost their jobs, were not allowed to be a part of the community, the society. Those words were great comfort, comfort for them. I go and prepare a place for you. The Greek word for place is the word topos. It has no hidden meaning. It means place. Some translations, this is the one we read today, say rooms. I don't like that room stuff. No. Jesus got more for me than just a room. Come on, y'all. I ain't going to heaven for no room. 
I done read my Bible. Talks about mansions and glorified places. Because God knows the tough time I've had here. He knows when I get there, I want to be somebody. I want to have some place. And it's not a comparison kind of thing. Everybody is going to be treated equal before God. So I don't want to read about no rooms. <laughs> you come to see me in glory, I got a whole bunch of rooms. So, we're homeless. Genesis 1, given a home. Genesis 3, kicked out of the home. You ever thought about Noah's family? You know, Noah lived large. Uh, you read the Patriarchs and Prophets, Noah and his family were people of status and station and position. And the Lord's going to lock them up with a bunch of smelly animals for a year. And, 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 and Ellen White describes their home before they were given temporary housing. The earth was rich and beautiful. Reading from the book, Patriarchs and Prophets, and the gifts of God's providence, the hills were majestic trees supporting the fruit-laden branches of the vine, the vast gardens like plains were clothed with verdure and sweet with the fragrance of a thousand flowers. The fruits of the earth were in great variety and almost without limit. The trees far surpassed in size and beauty the perfection we now find. Gold and silver precious stones laid out on the ground, that was their home, and they were put in an ark. You see the hist listen to me, the history of Kind is consistent. We have never been allowed to settle since we left the Garden of Eden. Now, I want you to think with me for a minute. Why is that the case? Because we like to be comfortable. Am I telling the truth? You know, I'm, I'm, I'm 81 now. I like comfort. And I'll come in now. My house disturbing me. Sit down, be kind of quiet, because I'm at home. Comfort. Why are you looking at me so straight? You know you like to be comfortable. You can work all day, you come home, prop up your feet. You don't want nobody messing with you. You want to be comfortable. That's why we go on vacations, don't we? To be comfortable. Prop yourself up on the sand, out by the river, by the ocean. We want to be comfortable. The danger of that is this. You can get so comfortable, you don't want to leave. But I got news for you. This ain't your place. See, 4904 where I live, that is not my place. That's a motel. Somebody's still listening to me. That place I call my home, that's my motel. What do you do at motels? Check in and check out. Come on and say amen, somebody. It's going to be a checkout. Got to calm down here. There's going to be a checkout day someday. Come on now. When the Lord's going to take me out of this thing, I think it's so precious and paid for it. I put flowers all around it, but it's not my home. God says, I'm going to check you out of there. Enjoy my sermon by myself. Y'all ain't saying enough amens out there. Yes, this, 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 this thing is, this thing is, this thing is real to me. I go and prepare a place for you. As an African-American male, I know what it is to feel like you never belong, never fit, never accepted. Just when you think you got enough degrees and enough money, you find out they cannot forget that your ancestors were slaves. They will not let you go, but God declares one day I will erase all those differences. We talked about it last week. Every nation, kindred, tongue, and people, and there shall not be no lines. There'll be no lines. There'll be no white and black drinking place, no white and black neighborhood. There's going to be one place and one God and one city and one world and one people. 
That's in my Bible. That's the book I live by. That's the book I live by. When Noah and his family came out, I read again from Patriarchs and Prophets. The entire surface of the earth was changed after the flood. The earth presented an appearance of confusion, desolation, impossible to describe. Now remember the paragraph I just read. The mountains, once so beautiful in their perfect symmetry, had become broken and irregular. In many cases, hills and mountains had disappeared, leaving no trace of where they once stood. On and on the description goes, and you can imagine how, how, how Noah and his family felt. In fact, Noah felt so bad, he got drunk. He could not take what he saw. God never wants you to get used to being here. Why would you want to stay? I counted this week. We won't go back to January 1. I counted this week. There was a mass shooting in this country every day this past week. Why do you want to stay here? Why do you want to stay here? For what? Now, they got snowstorms. <laughs> My brother's lived out in California for years. He's always sending me stuff about the weather. And uh, how comfortable it is. Hank, you ought to pack up and come on out here. I called that rascal last night. <laughs> Bro, I said, how deep is the snow? in California. Now, Lord, forgive me. I dissimulated a little bit. I said, you know, it's in the 80s here. Well, that was Thursday, but you know, it, it, you know, you know, you know. God, forgive me. God, forgive me. Because, because we, 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 we love, we love to have our places and our space. It's so important to us. And the deception of life is this. Even psychologically, mentally, and emotionally, without realizing it, you're getting attached. There's a reason why the Lord then told us, He didn't told us, I'm gonna burn that stuff up. And that's why that's why I don't, I don't talk about people that buy expensive cars. Give them something to burn. <laughs> yeah, go on, go on and buy yourself a big house now. Let him give him plenty of kindling. <laughs> Because it's all going away. I see so he's the great creator. And when he, remember we talked about that last week, when he finished making the earth, he said it was very, very good. You can't buy a house nice enough, move to a neighborhood beautiful enough to compare with what God has prepared for his people yet to come. Let's rejoice for a minute and give God glory. That's why there will be in heaven no big eyes and little use. Everybody's going to live the same. Because another thing that the devil does, you know, he fills us with envy. You know, people tell me, you know, Seventh-day Adventist pastor going through a rough time. I said, go look at the parking lot at the church. Before I go to the next page of my notes, I want to ask this question of you. Think about it. What are you attached to? You recall when Hezekiah was going to die, remember that? Got sick, boo and like a baby. Lord said to Isaiah, go back and go back and tell him he's going to be all right. Give him 15 more years. Shut up that crying. And then Hezekiah didn't want to take God's word. Give me a sign. The Lord is very tolerant. All right, what sign do you want? Well, I want you to do something with the sundial. Don't send it forward. Everybody does that. You know, God is very tolerant. I, I, I'd have told Hezekiah. Who do you think you're talking to, buddy? God just has come. Well, I'll, I'll make it go back. Okay. And Hezekiah 
didn't realize that that very sign stirred up these scientists in Babylon who came to see, I'm going someplace with this, came to see what God, what God, who, what, who, what God, not Hezekiah, what God had done. And Hezekiah spends the next several days showing them all his stuff. Huh? Come on now. Plush pile, carpet, refrigerator that opens itself up, <laughs> pops out ice. <laughs> you know, the stuff we brag about, you know. <laughs> his, ch his, chariot, his chariot whipped the horses by itself. You know, he did, showed them all the stuff he had. And God said, when they came, what did you show them? I showed them everything I have. All right, God said, okay, they're going to take everything you have. He never showed them the temple where he went to pray and asking God to heal him. Didn't tell them about the goodness of God. He showed them his stuff. Too many of us are showing folks our stuff. Show them Jesus. Talk about his righteousness, his goodness, his miracles, his care, how he wakes your sad carcass up every morning, even though you sin, answers your prayers, even though you've prayed the same prayer for a thousand times, he keeps on forgiving you. Show him that. Not your house and your clothes. He's going to burn that up. So one of our problems is we get attached. We get attached. And you have to watch yourself. Some of you notice I drive a dark blue Ram truck. It's my other toy. Always wouldn't have a Ram truck. 5.7 liter engine. 81 years old. Now what in the world I need with a five? But that's what we do. The Dunbar is what we do. I, <laughs> see, I'm being real, folk. I, 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 I passed it. I, I don't come with any, you know, fluff stuff. I'm, I'm a pre preacher, but I'm a sinner. Polish that thing up. Look at it. Walk, you, know, you know how you do. You can tell when a person's got a new car. They get out of belts, they get out of the church. Now, the folk who's had their car for 55 years, get out and walk away. But you can tell the Negro, excuse me, the person that's got... The person's, got, the person's got a new car. You can tell that because when they get out, they turn and look at it before they walk in church. Come on and say amen, somebody. You know I'm telling the truth. This stuff gets in our heads, gets in our minds, gets in our thoughts. We measure ourselves by this foolishness. God's crying out, hey, Henry, I got a place for you, and your blue truck don't fit. 5.7 liter engine. I got two wings for you. Hey, you can fly any place you want to go anytime you want as fast as you want to go. Faster than the speed of light. Yeah. So, here we are. Here we are. This place. He kept moving them. Remember, he, he, he scattered them from the Tower of Babel. Remember that? See, God has... You see, if you study the Bible, the Bible is hooked together by themes, themes. And one of the themes of the Bible is man's displacement. Tar of Babel sent him running. Just messed up the languages. Remember what he said to Abraham? He said, Abraham, leave your father and your mother. Remember that? And he didn't give him a new address. Go to a place I will show you. Oh, boy. Have you read Revelation? Have you seen the place he's shown us? I wish you'd go back and read that place. No more pain. No more sorrow. No more death. Abraham left. Lot. Remember Lot? That dummy. He's with He's with Abe now. Abe's a good man. And the Bible's very descriptive. I'm in Genesis 13 now. And they saw a land that reminded them of the Garden of Eden. Now, this is 4,000 years ago. Those folks still remembered the Garden of Eden, the stories they'd heard. See, Abraham's not that far removed from Noah. And they saw this place that lots of, I want to go there. I want to move there. Remember that? When he leaves, when he leaves Sodom, he leaves with nothing. Nothing. 
so much for getting attached. Jacob had to leave home. Jacob's entire family had to leave Egypt. Always something causing us not to fit. Well, I'm almost done now. Jesus, our Savior, has a reason for offering us a place. Because as a human being, he wanted to experience, Chris, our lack of placement. Here's the record. These words are sad. This is the Savior. John 1, 11, he came unto his own. You can finish it. His own did not receive him. His birth, and she brought forth her firstborn son, wrapped him in swaddling clothes, laid him in a manger, now the punchline, the sad sentence, because there was no room for the Savior to be born. This is Jesus. Then he cried in Matthew 8, 20, and Ellen White ties this text to when Judas came to join up with Jesus. He said, he was the scribe that came and said, Master, I will follow you. And Jesus read his mind and said, the foxes have holes. The birds of the airs have nests, Judas, but the Son of Man, I got nothing for you, buddy, has nowhere to lay his head. And so Jesus, before he could make that promise, had to live our experience. Jesus knows what it is not to fit. He understands when you step in some place and they'll look at you kind of funny. Jesus understands that. He knows what it is to be turned down, pushed away. He went, to his, he went to his own home and they said, is this not the carpenter, the son of Mary and brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon? Are they not his sisters with, here with us? We, so they were offended of him. He was not even welcome at his home where he grew up. And so now with earnestness, for Henry's sake, with earnestness, for Carol's sake, with earnestness, for your sake, Jesus is now preparing a place where I can settle down and belong. Somebody ought to say amen out there. Thank God for Jesus Christ. He's making a place where I never again have to make excuses, never again have to have an explanation, never again have to be concerned about somebody coming and knocking on the door and telling me I can no longer stay. This is a permanent place, everlasting life. So he being the form of God, Paul writes, did not consider it equal to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, made himself a person with no place, taking the form of a bondservant, coming in the likeness of men, and being found in appearance. Oh, I love these verses. As a man, he humbled himself. He humbled himself and became obedient to the, death of, to the point of death, even the death of the cross. You recall that John 14, 1 to 3 is spoken in a certain context. See, in the old Greek Bible, there's no division between chapters. One chapter goes into another. So chapter 13 and chapter 14 are really the same chapter. And you recall that in the closing verses of chapter 13, that's when Jesus exposes Peter. Remember that? You're going to betray me. You're going to betray me. Peter, not me. I'll, I'll die for you. And then right there in front of all the apostles, the leaders of the new Christian church, 
Jesus says, no. Before the cock crows three times, which meant before the sun rises tomorrow, you will have betrayed me three times. Right after those verses comes what we call John 14, 1 to 3. It's actually a continued conversation. It's to Peter mercy, that Jesus is saying, I go and prepare a place for you. You're going to betray me? I'm already working on your mansion. You're not going to stand by me, but I believe you're going to get through it. You're not the man you say you are, but I got enough confidence that the Holy Spirit in you, Peter, is going to make you a great man. So in faith, I'm already before you get your life straight. Thank you, Father. Before you become the Christian, you ought to be. Thank you, Jesus. I'm already, Henry, working on your mansion. So when you finally get straight, I got a place for you. Hallelujah. Where's Milka? Milka, come on, sweetie. Come on. Brothers and sisters, I offer you the promise of God. I offer you the promise of God. Listen as Milka sings. I'm good. 
give him back to him all oh, the praise he's worthy of I've been forgiven and that's why I love him so much and I come to pour my praise on him like oil from Mary's alabaster box don't be angry if I wash his feet with my tears and I dry It is, um, it is comforting to me to know that one day soon we're going to leave this world behind. Amen. Nothing here to hang on to. It, it, it really isn't. I don't care how much money you pay for the car, it wears out. I don't care how nice the house is, every now and then it needs fixing, am I telling the truth? We buy warranties for the appliances, Jim, in our house, because we know they're going to wear out. But I'm talking about a place, folk, where not only does the stuff not wear out, not only does the stuff not wear out, I'm not going to wear out. Hallelujah. I'm not going to wear out. So in spite of the kind of person I am, says, Henry, just hang in there. i got a place for you. Folk, isn't that wonderful news? If you're thankful for that, would you just stand with me now? now, with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, very soft, Dan, very soft, Dan, there may be some person here today who has never, ever given yourself totally to Jesus. Maybe a young person. Last week, by the way, at the end of service, a little boy came to me at the door and said, I want to be baptized. Well, today, I'm going to make it more visible. Maybe you just want Bible studies. You're not ready to be baptized, but you, you've been visiting this church. Maybe you grew up in it. You've never said yes. Now, folk, I need you praying. If you're here, would you find the courage to just come forward, walk forward? Shh, everybody's praying. Let's see if someone will move and come forward. Yeah, I know it's a big deal, but what Jesus did is a big deal. Move from where you're standing and just come. Man, woman, boy, girl. 
I know you're not used to this at Beltsville, so this is a little, little different, but that's all right. Father, thank you so much that I can go home this evening not worried about where I'm going to be. You've told me with you. Bless you, bless you, bless you. Let the church say amen. amen. Stay right here with me. That took courage. Somebody else? Somebody else? Father, we cling to your promise. We take you at your word. We'll be ready to go home. I don't have one yet, but we'll be ready to go home. We promise you, when the trumpet sounds, when the dead in Christ rise, we'll be there. In Jesus' name, that all the people say, amen. amen. Please be seated. God bless you. I want you to sit right here on the front row. Sifa, would you come and get her name and so forth? Now, I messed up last week. I had you sit down. I should have told you to stay up because we're going to sing the closing song. So come on, get on up and talk about me after church, not doing church. Get on up, sing the closing song. Let's bow our heads with prayer. Father in heaven, thank you so much for what we have experienced here today. You've shown us that this is not our home. Help us to prepare to be with you. Now, as we leave this place, never leave our presence, Lord, because we need you. But Father, come quickly. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.